today in this uh, presentation we are going to refer to the judiciary in india this uh, module falls in uh, indian politics paper 1 uh, this uh, paper has been coordinated by professor ajay mera of delhi university the content writer is dr niranjan sahu and i am ashutosh kumar i am a professor in punjab university chandigarh i am also national coordinator for epg patshala in the subject of political science so we would discuss in this module about the judiciary in india how the judicial institutions have been shaped in india as we all know that in every government there are three organs legislature executive and judiciary and in india like in any other liberal democracy there is a doctrine of separation of powers and there is also a doctrine of checks and balances so the three organs of the government have got their own powers and their own role in making the government a responsible government a limited government because all the democratic governments are supposed to be limited government responsible government for that there is a need of checks and balances and judiciary is very much needed to act as to perform the task of adjudication of law so law making is the job of the legislature the law implementation is the responsibility of the executive and the law adjudication is the task of the judiciary in any democratic polity now when we refer to the judiciary in india we understand that judiciary in india has got a pyramidal structure and supreme court of india is considered the apex court it is the court of record also in the sense that the decisions of the supreme court are binding under article 141 they are the decisions are binding on all the subordinate courts also the supreme court has the power to punish anybody who shows contempt not only to the supreme court but contempt to the judiciary as such also so supreme court is considered the apex court supreme court is also considered as the federal court see there are several jurisdictions given to the supreme court of india under article 131 the supreme court of india has got the original jurisdiction so whenever there is a dispute between the center and the state or there is a dispute between one state government and another state government or there is a dispute between the central government and the state government on the one hand and the other state government on the other in such matters which it relates to the center state dispute or inter state dispute the supreme court has got the power of original jurisdiction that means that the decision of the supreme court shall be binding on all the concerned states and the center then the supreme court has also got the appellate jurisdiction so appellate jurisdiction can be with regard to two kind of cases the civilian cases as well as the criminal cases in case of the civilian cases if the case has been decided by the high court and high court while delivering the decision certifies that the case is such that it involves a substantial question of law or it involves the interpretation of the constitution in both cases the civil case would be heard by the supreme court if it comes up for an appeal to the supreme court then there is also uh, appellate jurisdiction provision for the criminal case see in the case of in case of uh, criminal cases if the while delivering the decision if the high court certifies that the criminal case is such that it involves it involves a substantial question of law then the civil criminal case would go for an appeal to the supreme court then there can be another possibility and that possibility is that suppose a person has been uh, facing trial in the subordinate court 
and the subordinate court has not given any punishment to that person, then the case goes for a review to the high court and the high court gives him death sentence. Or a case was under the consideration of a subordinate court. Meanwhile, the case was withdrawn to the high court and high court gave, um, declared the person as convicted and gave him death sentence. Then also the person can go to the Supreme Court against the decision of the High Court. Uh, then there can be third situation that uh, the criminal case is such that while delivering the decision, the High Court gives a certificate that the case is such that it involves a substantial question of law. In all these three cases, as I said, the death sentence by the High Court when the person was not given any sentence in the subordinate court or a case which was lying with the subordinate court which was withdrawn to the High Court and High Court giving the death sentence or third, that even if there is a punishment which is a minor punishment or whatever the criminal case is, nature is, but while delivering the decision if the High Court gives a certificate that the case is such that it involves a substantial question of law, then the criminal case shall also go for an appeal to the Supreme Court. Under Article 136, and that is very important, the Supreme Court can allow any petition for the review of a decision which has been delivered not only by the High Court, by any other court or any administrative tribunal except military tribunal. So any decision given by a High Court or subordinate court in any case, civil case or criminal case, can be taken up by the Supreme Court on its own without the certification by the High Court. So 136 gives a wide-ranging power of taking up the review of any case. And in fact, what we call about the judicial activism, we refer to the public interest litigation or the social interest litigations, as Upendra Bhatsi refers to, like Pratap Mehta refers it to. So this has also emanated from Article 136 because, as you know, the, the Supreme Court can take up any matter which it thinks is relates to the public interest or which is related to the rights of a person who cannot defend himself. So this is something 136. Then the Supreme Court also has got the, under Article 143, the Supreme Court has the advisory jurisdiction. What is advisory jurisdiction? Advisory jurisdiction is that the president can refer the, any matter which is a matter of public interest to the Supreme Court for its advice. Now, it is not binding on the Supreme Court to give the advice. At the same time, even if the Supreme Court gives the advice to the government on its, when the matter is referred to it for its advice, the advice of the Supreme Court shall not be binding on the government of India. So, to sum it up, the Supreme Court has got not only the appellate jurisdiction or the original jurisdiction, but the Supreme Court has also got the advisory jurisdictions. After dealing with this, and as you can see that as I referred Article 143, it is very clear that as Granville Austin and then the Pratap Mehta, they all have referred that the Supreme Court has been able to give the decisions which are binding on all courts of the country. Then the Supreme Court of late has also taken on its own to frame the rules or to make the rules for regulating the practice and procedure of the court and also making the rules or the law. For example, one can refer to the Vishakha uh, judgment of the Supreme Court, whereas whereby the Supreme Court framed the rules to protect the women in the working place from sexual harassment. At that time, there was no law. So law came afterwards. So that way, the Supreme Court has been uh, doing this progressive interpretation of law using its power under Article 141 to make the law and making it binding on not only the subordinate courts, but also on other institutions of the state. Now, let us discuss about the composition of the Supreme Court and the way the Supreme Court judges are appointed. As we know that the Supreme Court at present has 
uh, the strength of 31, 30 judges and one chief justice of India. The judges are appointed by the President of India on the advice of the Council of Ministers, but in reality, as you know, after the, uh, the, the declaration of the 99th Amendment as unconstitutional, which had provided for the National Commission for the appointment of the judges, now the situation is what it has always been after the third just case in 1993. So what has been the position right now? The position is that the person should have the following qualification. Either a person should be considered as an eminent jurist in the opinion of the president. So an eminent jurist can be considered for the position of the judgeship in the Supreme Court or a person has been a lawyer in the high court, more than one high court can be possible, but it should be continuous uh, uh, legal practice in the high court for 10 years or more, or the person has been a judge of the high court for five years, uh, maybe one high court or more than one high court in a continuous manner. So these three conditions, either of the three conditions should be fulfilled. As I said, to recapitulate, the person should be either an eminent jurist or the person has been doing the legal practice for 10 years in one or more than one high court in a continuous manner or the person has been a judge in the high court for five years, at least five years. Then we all know that such people who are eligible to be considered for the judgeship in the Supreme Court, their name has to be recommended by a collegium. Collegium consists of the four senior most judges and presided over by the Chief Justice of India. Now suppose there is a judge to be appointed for say Madras High Court and there is nobody in the collegium who has served in Madras High Court but there is a judge in the uh, Supreme Court who has served earlier in Madras High Court before joining the Supreme Court, then that judge opinion can be taken up by the collegium, though the, that judge would not have the power to vote. So it is de decided by the collegium whose name to be recommended for the appointment of the judge in the Supreme Court or judge in the High Court. There are 27 high courts in India. As we all know that there can be one high court for more than one state. Like you have Punjab and Haryana high court, which has the jurisdiction over both Punjab as well as Haryana and also has the jurisdiction over the Chandigarh Union territory. This slide this, that the recommendation of the, the collegium to the law ministry and to the president, and that is something like binding on the government. What the government can do, the government can ask the collegium to reconsider any name which has been forwarded to it um, by the collegium and the law ministry can give its comments also and then the collegium would be reconsidering the name and if the collegium gives the same name again, collegium puts forward the same name again, then it would be binding for the president to accept the advice and that's why of late we have found a kind of deadlock between the executive and the judiciary to some extent as is reported by the media that many posts are lying vacant and the recommendations have been made but the president has not really issued the order for the appointment of the judges. So this is something we should understand and we should think about that why this kind of uh, provision has been made. While rejecting the 99th constitutional amendment which had uh, provided for the National Judicial Appointment Commission, NJSE, uh, the Supreme Court referred the independence of judiciary as the basic feature of the Constitution. As you know, in the uh, Keshwanand Bharti versus State of Kerala 1973, the Supreme Court has held that though the Parliament can amend any part of the Constitution, including Part 3 of the Constitution, but the amending power would not mean that the basic features of the constitution can be violated. So there lies the basic feature doctrine in the 
constitution of India. So basically, the, the independence of the judiciary is considered as the basic feature of the constitution and the judiciary has been very insistent right from the second judge case and the third judge case that the judicial appointment should be non-political appointment and judicial appointment should be made on the professional basis and the judiciary should have independent hand. The higher judiciary should have independent hand in recommending the name, though there has been of late the admission of on the part of the Honorable Supreme Court to show a transparency and make public the, the proceedings of the collegium while considering the name of certain people, name of people for the appointment as judge in the High Court or appointment in the Supreme Court as a judge. Now the relationship, at the outset I referred about the doctrine of separation of power or the doctrine of checks and balances. Now if you see the constitutional history of India, the political history of India, there has been always a very interesting relationship between the legislature and the executive on the one hand and the judiciary on the other. The problem started right from the beginning when the government of India, the, led by Jawaharlal Nehru, went for the land reforms, went for several laws, states, because land is a state subject. So many state governments passed the, not only the Jamindari Abolition Act, but also the Land Ceiling Act and others. And at that time, since right to property was a fundamental right under Article 19, uh, F and also under Article 2031, when the case went to the High Court or to the Supreme Court, under Article 32 or under Article 226, in the case of High Court, it would be Article 226. When there's a violation of the fundamental right, one can directly move to the High Court. Or under Article 32, if there's a violation of fundamental right, one can move to the Supreme Court directly without going to a subordinate court. So there was a kind of conflict between the center and legislature, even parliament and the judiciary or the state legislature and the state high court with regard to the land reforms. And so the wire media was taken out and the first constitutional amendment was brought in by the parliament under which the ninth schedule was added. And it was said that all those statutes which would be kept in the ninth schedule would be immune from judicial review. So all the law, land reform related legislations were put in the ninth schedule and in the Sajjan Singh and in the Shantri Prasad case, it was held, Sajjan Singh and Shantri Prasad case, it was held that the that the, any uh, law which would be a result of a constitutional amendment that uh, shall not be declared unconstitutional on the basis of Article 13. See, under Article 13, it is very clearly written, it was written also earlier also, that if there is any law which is violative of the fundamental rights provision as given under uh, Part 3 of the Constitution, to the extent it is violative of the fundamental rights, it shall be declared as unconstitutional. So under that provision, the people were moving to the court against the land reforms legislations. So and uh, now the uh, what the position of the government was that we are not going for ordinary law we are going for constituent law and we are bringing the law as a result of a constitutional amendment so all those statutes would be kept in the ninth schedule making it immune from the judicial review and this position was accepted by the judiciary to have a balance of power between the, the judiciary and the uh, legislature but this situation changed with the Dwolat Nath case. In 1967, the Dwolat Nath case, uh, Dwolat versus State of Punjab. So after that, 24th and 25th amendments were brought by, um, uh, were passed by the parliament when Indira Gandhi was the prime minister and the Congress was having the majority. Right. So under 24th constitutional amendment, they added a, a provision in the Article 13 saying that if the law is a result of a constitutional amendment, then that law shall not be uh, subject to um, uh, judicial review and uh, subject to, uh, then they would, that law would not be declared as unconstitutional on the basis that it is, viola it was, it is violative of the fundamental rights provisions. 
So that way, 24th Amendment also said okay. that the, if the constitutional amendment bill is passed under Article 368, then it shall be presented to the president and the president shall not have the power to reject it. 25th Amendment brought the 31C, which said that if there is any law which is made in accordance with Article 39B and C, even if that law is violative of Article 14 and 19, and 31 also, but now 31 has been repealed, then it shall not be declared as unconstitutional. So both 24th and 25th Constitutional Amendment were challenged in the Keshwan and Bharti case, 1973. And in the Keshwan and Bharti case, the decision of the Dulat Nath came into reconsideration, came for review. And now the Supreme Court said in the Keshwan and Bharti case that yes, the parliament has the power to amend any provision of the Constitution but there are certain basic features which cannot be violated, which cannot be even by the parliament. So that has been, that has tested. This decision has been reiterated in the Manitra Gandhi case, in the Minerva Mill case also, the basic structure doctrine, and which has given tremendous power to the judiciary because the parliament doesn't have the exclusive power now. The, the parliament constituent power has been subjected to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Then we also refer, come to the public interest litigation and the judicial activism. See, this uh, we can refer to Justice P. N. Bharwati as a key architect of the PIL when he relates the principle of lotus standi. Earlier, the lotus standi was that if you are the aggrieved party only, then you can move to the court for judicial remedy. But now he said that there are many poor people, uh, illiterate people, uneducated people or the marginal people who are unable to seek judicial remedy for themselves. They don't have the resources, they don't have the education, they don't have the confidence to move to the judiciary. Somebody who is a social servant, who has social activist, can move on their behalf to the Supreme Court or to the High Court. So over the period we have this phenomena called PIL, there have been lots of public interest litigation and the judiciary has interfered and tried to give the reforms. Because of this judicial activism, whereby the judiciary has been taking up of not only taking up the, of the scrutiny of not only the executive but also the legislature and passing on the direction to the executive, now there is a talk about judicial activism, there is a talk about judicial overreach that it is being argued that the judiciary has taken up too many tasks to itself. So in that sense, we can say that PIL or the public interest litigation or judicial activism, they have not been free from controversy, free from debate. They have been always debated, but then at the same time, this is also there. The judiciary has done the human service to the cause of the rights. For example, you can take this like Article 21. Under the judicial activism, Article 21 refers to the right to life and personal liberty. So the Supreme Court in several decisions have said the life does not mean physical life. Life does means decent life. It's not an animal right. With the due respect to the animals, the human beings need opportunities. They need to fulfill their basic economic needs of shelter, food, clothing, employment. So the Supreme Court has been coming hard on the government and saying that the rights of the people, a right to good life, like the Supreme Court said right to food, right to shelter, right to have the education, they all should be covered under Article 21. So life should not be just merely a kind of living, but it should be a good living. It should be uh, having the access to the opportunity structures to develop one's potential and to go ahead. Now, when we refer to this uh, judicial law, as I said, that in the Vishakha case of Rajasthan and the Supreme Court in 1997 uh, framed the rules which would be applicable to the working places where the women would be working. Then there are several decisions like the environment-related decisions where the Supreme Court has come very hard on the government for the sake of Taj Corridor case can be taken up, where the Supreme Court has come hard hard and has tried to ensure that the environment is protected, environment is not 
violated. Also, uh, the Supreme Court, as I said, uh, has been talking about the judicial reform because there is a huge pending, 32 million cases have been pending and uh, mainly it is being accused that the judges are more concerned about the newsworthy cases where they are named and appear or they are more interested in this public interest litigation, social interest litigation rather than doing the mundane task, performing the mundane task of day-to-day -day administration of the law and to decide about the cases, writing decisions and all. This is also very important. So basically we need need a certain kind of certain reforms in the Indian judicial system. It is also been argued that the people who are working in the judicial services, there is a need to have an all India judicial service. In fact, uh, if you refer to the Article 249, it was explicitly mentioned that there should be an all India judicial service and that article belongs to 1950. So the original article and the Constituent Assembly was also of that opinion. So that has not become reality. So we can say that Indian judiciary has played a very important role in ensuring the doctrine of separation of power. There has been a check on the uh, politicians, check on the political parties. And in many cases, we have seen that the judiciary has interfered to protect the rights of the women, rights of the children, rights of the socially and economically marginal groups. One can always put a question mark about the representativeness of the judicial institutions because in the absence of the reservation there has been a kind of a, only the presence of the elite caste in the judiciary including the Supreme Court and we can also refer Supreme Court is non-accountable, uh, non-representative, non-elected and so um, and it's highly elitist and coming people, the judges who become judges, mostly they are from the judicial background and so there is also allegation that lots of favoritism takes place in the appointment of the judges and that's why the Supreme Court is coming clean on this and has been, has decided to make public the collegium to appoint the judges. Remember that the judges cannot be easily replaced, cannot be easily dismissed. There is a need of a passing of a motion of removal on the basis of the proof misbehavior or incapacity only then and that resolution has to be passed by a special majority, a special majority of Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha only then and the judges can be removed. And so far the only the impeachment motion has been against one judge in the uh, Supreme Court and that impeachment motion was also not, did not reach to its conclusion, logical conclusion and the justice, and the injustice in question facing the removal charge, uh, removal impeachment motion was saved. So that way there has been an independence of the judiciary. We all know that the judges, once they have been the judge of the Supreme Court, they cannot plead before any court or tribunal within India. They cannot take up any post of profit after leaving the office of the judge. They have a service tenure. So they retire at the age of 65. Their salaries are charged upon the Consolidated Fund of India. Their salaries cannot be altered until unless there is a financial emergency under Article 360. Otherwise, the judges are much more autonomous and independent, and the judges have really contributed a lot to the success of democracy. As I said, that any democratic regime needs to be a responsive regime, needs to be a limited government. So that way, the Supreme Court and the High Court, they have played very important role. Lastly, I would like to refer to the power of judicial review. So under Article 32, the Supreme Court and High Court under Article 2 to 6, if there is any law, administrative order, which is violative of the fundamental right, that law can be declared as, or that administrative order can be declared as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court as well as by the High Court. So judicial review power is very important in order to, to keep the balance and in order to ensure that uh, neither the executive nor the legislature over exceed their respective constitutional jurisdiction. So the need is to 
bring about the judicial reform, not only with regard to the appointments of the judges, transfer of the judges and all, brother judges, uncle judges, charge of nepotism also, but the most critical need today is to clear the pending cases because there are hundreds and thousands of the cases which have been pending in the Supreme Court and in the High Court. So there's a great need to speed up the matter, speed up the judicial process, and that's how the, the Supreme Court can perform its duty to the extent the Constitution makers wanted to do. And maybe the government can also pitch in by increasing the number of the judges, by filling in all the post, vacant post of the judges, both in the Supreme Court as well as in the High Court. So there's a need of uh, reforms, there's a need of a greater cooperation from the center uh, to, to fill in all the vacant post. And also the judiciary should also put self-restraint in the sense that the, if the, their relatives are working, in the, working as a lawyer in the court, they should move to other courts. So there is a need of uh, having a high level of judicial probity, character, and expertise. And as we have seen that of late, Indian judiciary has become an activist judiciary, has interfered uh, with the affairs. Whenever they have felt that the executive and the legislature are not performing their task, so right from the cleaning the roads, parks, or like uh, changing the corruption in the bureaucracy or like the non-accountability of certain institutions. The judiciary has played a very important role to ensure accountability, transparency in the democratic, democratic governance of India. Thank you very much.